Hello, everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for May the 30th, 2023. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. My name is Tim, and I am sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python that's designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Uh, CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to help support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from their site at adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel as well as the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically occurs uh, on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time or 11 a.m. Pacific Time, except when that coincides with a U.S. holiday, such as uh, this week when we are running the meeting on the Tuesday, uh, which is what we do. So if there is a clash with a holiday, then we will bump the meeting up to the, the following day, the Tuesday following that Monday. Uh, the time stays the same, so 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on the Tuesday uh, like we are doing this week. Uh, however, I do believe uh, we're back to the normal time uh, and day next week. There is a notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, uh, so you can use those to skip around the video to the parts that interest you most. The meeting tends to run about 30 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we'll post a link for the next meeting's notes document in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Uh, you can check the pinned messages uh, there to find the latest notes doc. Um, you can also add your notes into that document throughout the week. Uh, you, there's no need to wait for Monday or Tuesday or whichever day the meeting is going to be. Uh, starting uh, typically within an hour or so of the uh, previous meeting uh, ending, then that new note document will be made available and you can fill in uh, any time um, until the next meeting. Uh, Speaking of the meeting, it will be held in five parts. The first part of the meeting is going to be community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Uh, however, as the uh, newsletter does uh, you know, ship, so to speak, on Tuesdays, it's not so much of a preview this week, but a look at the newsletter that came out today. Uh, the second part of our meeting will be the state of CircuitPython, the libraries in Blinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from our status updates. Uh, the third section, and the first of our two round robins, is the Hug Reports section. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, take the time to recognize awesome folks in our community and beyond. Uh, the fourth part of the meeting, and the uh, second of the round robin sections, is the status updates section. In status updates, it's an opportunity for us to report on what we've been up to. You can take a couple of minutes uh, to talk about what you've been doing in the week since the last meeting and tell us what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. The fifth and final section is in the weeds. In the weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussion. These discussions can uh, come out of items in the status updates or they can be things identified ahead of time as too long uh, for status updates. So. Um, that covers how the meeting will go. Uh, so with that, I will scroll us down to community news, take a timestamp, and start us on the community news. So first item uh, this week is uh, there were two new versions of CircuitPython released. The CircuitPython team simultaneously released CircuitPython 8.1.0 uh, and a new beta, 8.2.0 beta 0. Uh, 810 remains unchanged from the 810 release candidate reported last week, and 820 beta 0 incorporates some interesting new features, such as continued enhancement of SynthIO, as well as alarm.sleep memory for the RP2040 port. Uh, there are links here to the Adafruit blog, as well as the release page on GitHub, if anybody is interested in those things. Uh, next up is uh, Microsoft Device Script for programming microcontrollers. Uh, Microsoft has quietly released a technical preview of device script. It brings uh, a professional TypeScript developer experience to low resource microcontroller based devices. Device script is compiled to uh, a custom VM bytecode, which can run in, a, uh, in very constrained environments. It uses Visual Studio code extension uh, to make integrated development environment with full debugging. Uh, 
so this is a new way that Microsoft has published for uh, being able to write programs for your microcontroller. We're all, of course, very used to writing Python programs for our microcontrollers, but uh, Microsoft has released this project to allow you to write uh, TypeScript, which is interesting. So if folks are uh, familiar with TypeScript and want to give that a try, there is a link here to uh, GitHub to check that out. Uh, and then uh, next up in the news this week is uh, the project of the re week, which was a handheld LoRa messenger using the WIO terminal. Uh, this is a handy LoRa messenger. It's built using a WIO terminal with a QWERTY keyboard. The keyboard matrix is scanned by GPIO with the software written in CircuitPython. There are links here to Twitter, Instagram, Tindy, and YouTube if you'd like to learn more about this neat little handheld messaging device. Uh, and so with that, I will tell you a bit more about the newsletter generally. So all of these items came from the CircuitPython weekly newsletter, which is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter that's emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives of that newsletter are available on adafruitdaily.com. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, you can edit next week's draft on GitHub, which is linked here in the notes document. Uh, there is a repository uh, for the newsletter, and you can find the drafts folder inside there, and they're all just dated files inside there. So you can find the one for the upcoming date and then uh, edit that to add your news item or project. Uh, another thing that you can do if uh, GitHub is a little bit beyond um, your capabilities, that's okay as well. You can also just tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter, or you can simply email to cpnews at adafruit.com. So next up, we will get into the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Uh, a note uh, about this, uh, as it says here in the notes doc, this report contains information from the previous seven days. Uh, any changes such as PRs uh, or issues or anything that's been merged, et cetera, um, that were made today are not included in this report. And the reason why I wanted to mention that today in particular, of course, we are having the meeting on Tuesday where we normally do Monday, which means uh, that it has actually been eight days since we last read the stats, which means that there is actually one day worth of stats that uh, fell through the cracks, so to speak. So uh, if anyone's interested, the report is still there. You can go find yesterday's report if you would like. Um, but I just wanted to mention that uh, because it was um, you know, the, the bounced week where we're doing the meeting on Tuesday, we do have a bit of stats that are not going to be represented in here. But we, of course, um, you know, appreciate all of the people who made those contributions nonetheless. Uh, so for overall section this week, uh, we had uh, 51 pull requests merged from 16 authors. Uh, of those 16 authors, I've highlighted a couple of names here for folks that uh, were either newer or less familiar to me at least. So these folks might be uh, newer or less frequent contributors, or it could just be the case that I hadn't happened to uh, see their name before, but those names are uh, Charlie Hotel, uh, Fam Huvin, uh, TK Roo, uh, let's see here, at Alan Torre, uh, and Nathan Y3G, and Andy Bing. So thank you to all of those folks as well as everyone else. Uh, and my apologies if I did miss anyone who was a newer contributor. We appreciate uh, all of the contributions uh, for sure. So uh, we had uh, seven reviewers this week. So thank you to all of our reviewers. Those do look like the uh, usual list of suspects. So thank you to all the folks who uh, are consistently uh, doing reviews for us. Of course, we uh, can't get uh, folks to be able to become authors unless we have reviewers to look over their work. So a uh, very important part of the process is the reviewers. Thank you to all of those folks. Um, and then overall, we're looking at 23 closed issues this week by 12 people uh, with 19 issues opened by 15 people. So net down a little bit uh, on issues overall. Uh, next up, I will send it over to Scott if you're available uh, to tell us about the core. Sure. Okay, stats for the core. We had 13 pull requests merged uh, from 11 different authors, so thank you to all of our authors. Um, we had three reviewers, so thank you as well, particularly to Mark uh, for, for doing some reviewing. Uh, we have 23 open pull requests, a number of those are drafts, 
a lot of those are drafts, especially the old ones. Um, and we're under th under that like one page threshold that I shoot for, so that's great. Um, and I'm sure these uh, like two we have what five that are two or three days old, so those will probably get uh, handled today or have been handled today already. Uh, on the issue side, we had six closed issues by five people and nine opened by six people. So we're actually a little lower than normal in terms of the numbers of people that are involved. Um, and we're also plus three issues. So uh, we have a total of 648 open issues. Um, and we'll work to get those down. Uh, we have seven active milestones. Um, these are used to track prioritization for those of us that are funded by Adafruit. Uh, those folks that aren't, uh, feel free to pick up other stuff as well. Um, 820 has zero open issues, and there are 36 open issues for 8xx, and there's also 30 open issues for 9.0. Um, so that's kind of, we're looking good for 8.2, and then we're going to have to figure out and reprioritize for 9.0, which will likely come next. Uh, we have one issue not assigned a milestone, um, so we'll, we'll want to make sure that everything's been triaged um, today as well. So that's it for the core. Alrighty, thank you, Scott. Uh, next up, I will hand it over to Katni, if you're available to tell us about the libraries. I am. How's my audio? Sounds good. Excellent. So this section is about uh, the CircuitPython and uh, Python community libraries. Uh, it applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit, Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as uh, the Adafruit community bundle and the Adafruit CircuitPython bundle and a couple extras. So across all of those repos, we had 34 pull requests merged from three different authors and four reviewers. Thank you to everybody who got through those. A lot of those were some uh, infrastructure things um, by one author and almost all of them were reviewed by, uh, by, by put in by Tectric and almost all of them were reviewed by Dan. So uh, thank you very much to both of them for taking the brunt of, of this recent uh, sweep. And that leaves us with 59 open pull requests. We had 13 issues closed by six people and nine opened by nine people, leaving us with 614 open issues. And 51 of those are labeled good first issue. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, head over to circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more. If you're interested in reviewing, check out the open pull requests. Leave uh, a comment. Let us know you took a look. Um, once you're comfortable with that, we can talk about leveling you up to the review team. If you're interested in contributing code or documentation, check out the open issues. Uh, they're listed by repository, and um, you can view all the title text. So you could do a certain page if you are looking for something specific, or you can just find something that interests you. Leave a comment, let us know you're working on it, and uh, get go ahead and get started. Um, if you are new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. We also have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython with, using Git and GitHub, so don't let the process intimidate you. And um, we are always available on Discord to help you out. Uh, we want you to be able to contribute in a way that works for you. In terms of Library Pi PI weekly download stats, the total statistics over 310 libraries, or total downloads over 310 libraries, was 129,250. And the top 10 libraries are listed in the um, note doc. I won't read them off, but it's an interesting um, short view into uh, what people are interested in. Um, NeoPixel is almost always at the top, no surprise there. Uh, library updates in the last seven days. Uh, we had one new library, CircuitPython underscore NAU7802. That was a transfer from the community bundle to uh, Adafruit um, because we want to be able to support it and um, the author did not uh, want to continue to do so. So we shifted it around and uh, got it to a place where it'll remain um, up to date. And we had a few updated libraries that I will not read off. That's where we are with the libraries. Excellent. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up, I will send it over to Maker Melissa to tell us about Blinka, if you're available, Melissa. I am. Uh, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single-board computers. This week, we had four pull requests merged by three authors and one reviewer. Uh, there are currently three open pull requests at 
amongst all the repositories. There were four closed issues by three people, one open by one person, uh, leaving a net of 96 open issues. There were 12,891 PyPI downloads in the last week. 7,513 PyBills downloads in the last month, and we are at 119 supported boards. And that's it. All right, thanks, Melissa. Uh, next up, we will we'll be getting into the Hug Reports section. Uh, Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll get us started, and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. If you're text only or missing the meeting, then I'll read uh, the notes for you once we get to your turn. Um, so I will kick us off. Let me get a timestamp here. Uh, right there. Uh, so hug reports for me this week. Thank you to uh, Mr. Goodbits, uh, I believe on uh, Discord, who shared some tips and fixes for my code uh, that I was working on during the uh, deep dive this past week. Uh, thank you to DJ Devin3 for submitting some fixes and improvements across a couple of different libraries and examples uh, in the past week or so. And then a uh, group hug for everybody. Uh, and so next up, we will hear from Dan. Okay, thanks. So I'd like to thank all the people who have been doing translations. Um, I went back just a little more than a year, and there are quite a few people. I'll just say them quickly. ADS256, Alvaro, Andy Bing, Atalantor, Bergdahl, Bill, ADAT, Boran Roni, Shamaloon, Senji Zhao, Electric Algorithm, Fab FJ Posada 2020, Hexthat, Lisa Apple, Lisan00, Naradoc, Pixel Clay, Santis, Neuros, Tawes, URFDVW, Urun Siabend, Yabend, W, Tuamura, and Utaro. Those people. There's a lot of people, they've been working on translations. We, it's wonderful to have people doing that because we can't do it. So we really appreciate these um, native speakers and others who are working on translations. Okay. Right, thank you, Dan. Um, next up is DJ Devin 3 who's text only, so I'll read. DJ Devin has hug reports for at Venture and uh, at L. Pekinen. Uh, for helping with a PWM function for controlling a 4-pin RGB LED over BLE with the Adafruit Connect app. Uh, DJ Devin also has hug report for Neradoc for letting me know I was using the wrong SSD 1306 library, and also a hug report for C. Grover for the Cedar Grove Itsy Bitsy Breadboard Adapter ECB. Uh, and so with that, I will send it over to Jeff next. Hello, I have a group hug and then a hug to Mark and Toddbot for keeping me interested in the synthesizer work. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next up is Katni. I have got a group hug for this week. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up is maker Melissa. I have a group hug for this week as well. All right. Melissa, uh, next up is Michael Pocusa, who's not present, so I'll read. Uh, Michael has a hug report for me, Foamy Guy, for extensive testing and reviewing the PR for Adafruit HTTP server library. Uh, and Michael also has hug reports for Neradoc and Holiday Hero for discussion about implementing a templating engine into Adafruit HTTP server. Uh, and next up is Scott. Hello. Uh, first, a hug to TK Roo for two board desks and now a circuitpython.org templating experiment. Um, hug to Justin for taking a look at PySigRock over the weekend and, and trying to figure out why the latest version doesn't work. Uh, hug report to you, Foamy Guy, for digging into why hiding lines slows everything down. That's a really weird problem. Um, and then lastly, hug to Chris Reed from PyOCD for meeting with me last week to help uh, with getting the MCU flasher code that I'm working on, working on top of PyOCD probes so you can use it from your computer as well. That's it for me. All righty, thank you, Scott. Uh, next up is Hectric, who I think is probably not here. I don't see in the list of Discord, so I'll read. Uh, Tectric says, uh, hug report for DJ Devin3 for great example fixes. Uh, hug report for me, Foamy Guy, as well as Neradoc and others who have caught and fixed interesting packaging and CI issues over the last couple of weeks, and a group hug as well from Tectric for everybody. 
Uh, so that is it for hug reports. Next up, we will get into the status updates section. So as a reminder, status updates is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I'll start and then we'll go through the list alphabetically. Uh, when I call on you, you can take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. Uh, it's also a, a good opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to whatever people are working on. Uh, if a discussion does become too long for status updates, then we can just go ahead and uh, move it down to the weeds section uh, towards the end of the meeting. So I will get us started for status updates as well. Uh, so last week I finished up the testing on the new HTTP server uh, library that uh, included many new functionalities and got that merged in. Uh, I also uh, finished up some testing on the EPD library for uh, the typing PR, uh, mostly trying to run it on a device and confirm the types of uh, a couple of different values that um, were used internally inside there. Uh, I started investigating an issue in Display.io in the core that's causing uh, hidden elements to take extra time uh, to render, which uh, I noticed now I did not write a complete sentence about, but that's what that is. If you have lines that are hidden, um, it makes the display refresh really, really slow, um, even compared to the same lines that are visible, which seems odd. Uh, so I started looking into that, learned a little bit about it, but definitely need to keep going a bit further uh, to find the actual meat of it. Um, over the past weekend, I did enjoy a bit of time off over the long weekend, which included taking a short uh, day trip with my wife uh, over to the next town over to see a concert. Um, however, uh, before hitting the road, I did uh, whip out the uh, the Matrix portal and uh, got a, a script on there to scroll the logo of the, band, the bands that I was interested in, which was a, a fun little thing to do to hype myself up. Um, over that uh, weekend as well, I also have polished up, uh, finished some documentation, or maybe let's say started some documentation uh, and published the initial version of a library called uh, somewhat unimaginatively CircuitPython RGB LED HTTP server, uh, which is basically uh, an API that allows you to interact with NeoPixels and DotStars uh, via HTTP requests. So you run this on your CircuitPython device, you have your uh, LEDs hooked up to that, and then from other devices on your network, you can uh, instantiate the strips and turn them to different colors and play animations and do all that same kind of stuff. Uh, for this week, I have been circling back to some of the typing PRs that went in around the time of PyCon, but haven't had any action since then uh, to see what I can do to get them uh, moving forward. Um, and then I also intend to dig a bit more on that display IO uh, issue. That's what I have got for my status updates. Next up, uh, we will hear from Dan. OK, so last week, I made releases for CircuitPython 810 final. And a couple days after that, for 820 beta 0. So we're uh, well caught up. 820 beta 0 has uh, a lot of SynthIO changes in it. There's still a little bit of work going on on SynthIO, but uh, the, the API, I think, is relatively stable now. So please try it out. Um, I'm working, I got this idea after getting frustrated about how long it takes to run make fetch sub modules to try to make that be port specific. And I originally thought it might be automatic. I'm not so sure that's a good idea right now. And I'll talk about this in the weeds. But I still think it's a good idea to make it port specific, if possible. Um, for 900, um, I've started re-reviewing uh, Greg Neverov's async I.O. port from CPython. And I will start um, merging in uh, the version 1.19.1 from MicroPython. And then we're going to do v1.20. Uh, Jeff will probably do that. Um, so uh, we can catch up to MicroPython, MicroPython's changes and bug fixes. OK, that's it. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, next up is DJ Devin, who's text only, so I'll read. Uh, DJ Devin says, uh, submitted some quick PRs to fix outdated syntax in the SSD 1306 and PCA 9548 examples uh, within the libraries. 
I think these kinds of code updates could be labeled as good first issue because they're even easier than type annotations. Uh, and I think those, if I recall correctly, those are switching like bus IO uh, over to board I2C, uh, which I would agree with. If anybody knows of more of those, those could definitely be a uh, good first issue labeled. Um, finished a rechargeable RGB LED candle powered by an itsy bitsy NRF. 52840, uh, the Itsy Bitsy does not have battery capability until you put Cedar Grove's Itsy Bitsy breadboard adapter on it. Uh, it uses BLE with the Adafruit Connect app to change the color of a single four pin RGB LED. Uh, DJ Devin added Flickr, Pulse, and Rainbow. Uh, didn't use any animations libraries. The PWM animations are coded from scratch, which I am quite proud of. Uh, people having issues with uh, people having issues running a Pi Pico with an SSD 1306 display and multiple I2C sensors is an issue I see come up regularly in the help with uh, CircuitPython channel. Uh, DJ Devin has created a basic example and will be submitting it to the examples uh, in the library. Uh, user Timex40 on Reddit is having a hard time getting OpenSky Networks API uh, authentication working with CircuitPython. Uh, yes, Adafruit has a subreddit. The API tracks a single transponder or all transponders in a geographic area for multiple, uh, let's see, for multiple of commercial aircraft types. I jumped right in, uh, jumped right on it, and within a day created three API examples for Adafruit request library. Uh, there are rate limits and daily limits. You get 100 calls per day if you're unauthenticated and 4,000 calls per day if you are, authent are authenticated. Uh, to use the authenticated version, simply sign up for the website and provide your username and password in the settings toml file. Uh, and so next up, I will pass it over to Jeff. Hello. I'm uh, right this moment trying to debug the problem with audio filtering. Um, so I need to find our notes document here. Bear with me for a second. So uh, yeah, I'm doing more SynthIO work as I just let slip. Uh, we merged a great pile of stuff last week, but one thing that kind of diverges from what I implemented to what uh, our community wants is uh, in audio filtering. So when you want to do a high pass or a low pass or a band pass filter, I used an inappropriate technology, so I'm trying now to adapt it to what I think is better suited, which is a filtering methodology called biquads. And that, if I can get it going, will work um, on a per note basis. So each distinct note or sound will be able to have a different uh, frequency filter applied to it. And outside of CircuitPython, I'm working on a project to do a fully uh, self-contained CPM emulator. It uh, will use the Pico, or excuse me, the, the DVI feather to show your output on the display and the USB host feather so that you can attach a keyboard to it. And inside will be like a 1980s CPM environment that's literally running those old programs. Um, I've been working with the USB host feather today in Arduino, and it works pretty slick. I hope someday we get that working in CircuitPython, but that's uh, not what I'm taking on right now. Anyway, that's up with me. Thank you. Alrighty, thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up is Jose David, who's missing the meeting, so I'll read. Uh, Jose says, take advantage of some free time to catch up with some of the recent Foamy Guy streams. Uh, they inspired me to work in a simulation library for the HT16K33. Uh, it currently works with the 8x8 matrix and the 7x4, uh, 7x4 segments, um, as well as the 14x4 segments with similar code to the CircuitPython HT16K33 library. Uh, and there is a link here uh, in the doc if anybody would like to check out that uh, new library that Jose worked on. Um, the other item that Jose has here in status updates uh, worked, on, worked in the scale library. Uh, this was a library that Jose created a long time ago, uh, but it's now been updated and added to the community uh, bundle and showed the capabilities in Discord uh, show and tell channel. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Thank you to Jose for filling those in in the notes doc. Uh, next up is Katni. All right. So uh, last week published the Canary Nightlight Guide. I'm really excited about that. Uh, ran into a ton of issues getting it going in the first place um, because there's some issues with my whatever I was writing for my code in the ESP32 S2. Uh, the S3 worked perfectly, so luckily um, I had help from Jeff to figure that out, and 
uh, so on and so forth, and you know, multiple times figured out the code needed to be refactored and so on, and, and it was uh, a very um, welcome conclusion <laughs> to have that done and working. Um, I was off Thursday through today, um, and late Wednesday I picked up the RP2040 DVI Feather Guide. Uh, I'd started that a while ago, and then it got bumped uh, priority-wise by other things. Um, so, uh, and then obviously I was I was not working. So this week I will be finishing up the DVI, the Feather DVI Guide. Um, it was actually much further along than I thought it was, uh, which is excellent. Thank you, past me. Um, and then the next step is the Chalk Neo Key Breakout Guide and the TRS Jack breakout guide. The NeoKey guide will have code examples, et cetera. The TRS Jack guide is simply um, pinouts and uh, schematic, et cetera. So um, not much going on with it uh, other than using it. <laughs> um, no code needed. And that's probably what I'm working on this week. There's a bunch of other stuff on my list, um, but uh, at least for the next two days, that is my stuff in order. That's what I've got. All right. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, let's see. Last week, I finished up the Magic Storybook Project Guide I, uh, that I collaborated on with Aaron. Uh, the guide is now live. I fixed an issue with the CircuitPython code editor that was preventing text highlighting from working properly. And I updated the Raspberry Pi ST7789 kernel display driver to work with the correct offsets for the 1.14 inch display. Uh, this week I'm continuing looking at the Raspberry Pi installer script display issues. Uh, then I'll check out some of the uh, Blinka slash platform detect uh, pull requests and issues. Um, I'll take a look at the circuit at some of the circuitpython.org and code editor issues as well, and I'll possibly be updating the matrix portal library. And that's where I'm at. Excellent. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, next up is Scott. Hello. OK, so I added spy support to the pirate code and got it working with Flash ROM, which is a cool tool. Uh, it's usually used for like motherboard chipsets, I think. Uh, it's an easy way to dump the contents of an external flash. So I just had like a Metro and I just connected reset so that the MCU wouldn't start and then clipped onto the flash chip and was able to read, uh, copy the contents off. So that was pretty neat. Um, I circle back to polishing the MCU flasher code. The CMD21 works, the 51 works sometimes, but other times it doesn't. And it works, it like, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, I need to poke at it some more and figure out uh, what the J-Link is doing differently because it seems like it seems to work still. And I need to test the NRF52, but I don't actually expect any issues with that. Uh, I'm going to be mixing that with uh, adding one wire and UART support to the pirate code, um, and that'll align the mode numbers in the selection, which will be kind of nice. Um, I did briefly try tax tiny USB, USB host changes for the IMXRT, uh, but I didn't have much luck, and it's, it can be really frustrating debugging that, so I just didn't do it yet. So that's kind of on my longer to-do list. Um, something that's been on my mind a lot, inspired by Jeff that I mentioned before the meeting, was um, I've been thinking about like modular synthesis like Eurorack really is somewhat interesting to me, but it's pretty expensive to get into like even just a, a like amount for your modules is like a case is like a hundred plus dollars which I just think is kind of absurd so I've been thinking about a like take separating the the how you interact with it part from the actual audio generation and I think that um, Jeff's stuff is really interesting. So I was thinking about making these mini synth modules that mirror the classes in SynthIO that Jeff has added, and then that would al allow you to like use it like a physical synth, but in reality, all you're doing is like changing the structure of, of the SynthIO classes under the hood in CircuitPython. So I thought that'd be cool, and, and it'd be hopefully a lower-cost way to get into um, 
modular synthesis. So I've been thinking about that as well. And that's PCB design and all those sorts of fun things too. All right. The lastly for status updates is Tectric, who is missing the meeting. So I will read. Tectric says, uh, last week applied the jQuery and PyLint patch to all the libraries. Updated the build CI to run PyTest and switch all libraries with tests to use PyTest. Added the ability for a couple repos to build wheels for download from PyPy. Uh, started creating a build CI check to verify if libraries are correctly labeled as modules or packages. Uh, and then Tectric says for this week, finish up the new library CI to check on the module slash package verification. Prepare a patch for how docs are built. Uh, they're currently built from within the library's docs folder, but they will now be built uh, from the root folder, uh, which I will have to keep in mind. Um, and then the last thing Tetric says is catch up on a few PR reviews. Uh, and that is it for status updates. So the uh, fifth and final section of our meeting is in the weeds. Let me take the uh, top timestamp for that. Uh, and then I'll tell you about it. In the Weeds is an opportunity for long form discussions that either came out of status updates or were identified ahead of time and put into the notes document. If you've got any In the Weeds topics, please make sure they're added into the bottom of the notes document. We do have a couple there now, so we will get into those. Anybody else knows of topics, go ahead and add those while we're talking though. That way we're not waiting around at the end. So uh, first item in the Weeds is from DJ Devin, who's text only, so I will Read this one out. Let me do put a timestamp in there. Uh, let's see here. There are three similarly named CircuitPython libraries for the SSD 1306 display. Uh, this cost DJ Devon some time using the wrong library. It worked right up to the point of using display.show and then through errors. Uh, if it fooled me, it definitely could fool someone else. Also scrolling through the CircuitPython bundles, uh, library bundles slash lib folder, you will come upon the Adafruit CircuitPython SSD 1306 library first due to the alphabetical order. There's got to be a better way. Uh, additional info was added by Dan H, it looks like. So there's uh, three repos, the Adafruit CircuitPython Display.io SSD 1306, um, which is the newest of the three, I believe. That one, is, so that's the full name of the repo that I gave. Uh, if you're using it, in code, of course, you would omit CircuitPython, so that import would be Adafruit underscore display.io underscore SSD 1306. Um, that's the first repo. The second repo is Adafruit CircuitPython SSD 1306, so no display.io in the name. This is the non-display.io uh, driver, so this one was older um, a little bit, I assume. The import for that would be Adafruit underscore SSD 1306. Again, uh, sans the display I.O. in that one. Uh, and then the third repo is Adafruit underscore Python underscore SSD 1306, uh, which would be imported as Adafruit underscore SSD 1306 uh, capital, it looks like. And it says here that one was deprecated uh, and archived, and it was a C Python library, and it's not in any bundle. So it sounds like maybe that was uh, the oldest one, a precursor to all of them, perhaps even from before the time of CircuitPython. Um, and then DJ Devin mentions as well, there's a similar situation for the SSD 1305 um, as well. And there may be a couple others, any, basically any displays that existed before Display.io with their drivers. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily know of the best way to approach it that would be any different than what there is today though because it's basically like there's essentially two drivers that are supported the display o driver and the non display o driver um they both deserve their spot in the bundle uh, as far as i'm concerned we could potentially try to rename one or the other but then there's a whole lot of code out there that uses it that would have to get changed as well for the imports um Eventually, have to change the settings in the repo or something like that. If we actually change the repo name, I don't know that it would be worth as much work as it would be to try to make a change like that, but um, potentially it could make it less confusing. Um, I don't know. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a tricky problem. I would say I 
I don't think there are very many displays out there that have the older non-display I.O. drivers. Um, I run across a lot more uh, newer drivers that are just by default display I.O. So I think that is kind of the way going forward, but there will always kind of be these ones that existed before that and thus have the other, uh, the other driver. Uh, does anyone have thoughts on like naming scheme or any kind of way that maybe that could be made less confusing? Uh, maybe we could link to each driver in the um, readme file. I'm just going to say, like, this is the display I.O. driver for the non-display I.O. I think driver go here. We do. I've seen something like actually. Oh, oh okay. I didn't even check. So. I, I, look, I mean, there are quite a few. Like, just, just beginning with SSD, besides 1306, there's 1351, 31, 25, 22, 1305, 1327. So, <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> Um, I mean, the, the SSD is a company, <laughs> right? right? So all of their driver supports will start but with all SSD. these. All these are um, frame buff. No, actually, some of them are not. They're display I/O, so the naming is not consistent. Yeah, I think maybe what happened is they. So the original pre-display I/O drivers would have been just like Adafruit underscore circuit python underscore ssd 1306 but then display io came along new repo was created with display io in the name for those drivers that had frame buff versions but then like moving forward i think there's not making frame buff drivers anymore so the new ones are not having that display io word uh, in the repo so right. that i think is the in inconsistent part there there are only two drivers that are frame buff or that at least have frame buff in the description that overlap with the other ones and those are the 1305 and 1306 so ideally to make the name consistent we would rename the non the frame buff ones to be like underscore frame buff underscore ssd something and then rename the other ones the other way and we could do that on a major version boundary and then change all the uh, all the learn examples of which there aren't that many probably if any you mean basically always you mean to change the class name or to change the repo name or both both because we really need to be consistent we really have to swap we have to get rid of the underscore display IO underscore names. Now, maybe it's not worth it, okay? Um, we, could, we could also rename the, the, the frame buff ones to, be, to include frame buff in the name, and then that would make it more obvious. So there's sort of like two steps here. One is to add frame buff and deprecate the old name, and the other is to re, is to really almost swap the names or make the display i1 be the not be the name without any modifier yeah which i think is how it is on the newer display it is it is right 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 yeah. yeah i think adding frame buff to the old ones is probably in my mind the thing that might help the most because that would make it so that when you see the name of the library if it has frame buff in it, then it's the old driver. And if it doesn't, then it's the new driver. And you know it will be display IO, whether it does or doesn't have display IO. Although it would be good potentially to be consistent as well and go add display IO to the ones that are missing it. But I think even just even just doing frame buff on those ones would probably help out quite a bit in my mind. Right. And I've noticed this. I'm uh, DJ Dev is not the only person. Like I've helped a number of people who had this problem and I myself was confused or I had to ask which driver do you mean you know and stuff like that so I think it's worth at least doing the renaming of, of the not of the frame buff ones to include frame buff in the name so maybe we can start I think the, the, the danger of renaming anything is that you break existing guides and libraries that use it it's, yeah but it's easy to fix the guides so and um, GitHub 
does it puts in a redirect automatically when you rename. Yeah. So why don't we maybe don't if think... when DJ Devin is back online, we can ask them about what sounds good. I mean, Caddy, do you have any particular thoughts about this? Not really. Most of what you folks are saying is 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 the things I would also consider. Um, above all, I want consistency in some form. But what that consistency should be for this particular uh, situation is is I think the thing we need to make a decision on because I don't really have a, a suggestion for that part of it. So maybe after the meeting, like I won't pursue this. Like maybe I'll just see what is in the learn what what's in the learn guides. Okay. And 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 see how much work it would be to change that, and I, I can report back in 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 the channel. That would be good. I think that's a um. That's an important piece. Yeah. Um, I mean, we do obviously have folks who can be assigned that to do it, uh, but it's important for us to consider like is that worth the time and and how much time would it take and so on so i think that's a good next step is to figure out how much work it would be to actually change all this and then start making decisions about whether to change it yeah yeah all right i'll do that i'll do that okay uh, worth uh, mentioning as well i think jeff put in the chat here uh kind of um with regards to one of the other things dj men dj dev mentioned which was that it it, it was not obvious that he had the wrong library uh, until kind of like the very end. All the code was written, he ran it, and it gave this potentially cryptic error, uh, which says like function takes one argument, but two are given basically because show in the frame buff driver is not expecting any arguments, but show in the display IO driver is expecting either a group or a tile grid. Um, Jeff leaves us with the question, could we add specific error handling to show that it has a more useful error? I think that's also probably a really good idea that would help on those frame buff drivers. They could check if you pass them a group or a tile grid, um, potentially without importing display.io somehow, probably would be best. Um, they, can't, they can't check that then, yeah, because... Or, I mean, really, it could check if you pass it anything, I suppose. We right, even... right, right. Even a dummy second argument. And yeah. then something like that, that I think would probably be a good idea as well for the errors, because it does, if we leave somebody a breadcrumb there, um, I think that helps make it less confusing overall as well. Whereas right now, the like... The show is going to go away in 900. You, uh, what was that? show is going to go away. Oh. Uh, IO. Oh, display that show yeah, is so going to go it's away. Using the property now as well. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Uh, so that point so, we, so we encourage people to use the property. So, right, yeah. this would be only for a short period of time. Yeah, that's that, true. Which yeah, um, we you can assign an unexpected property of a Python class. So that's an error. You you'd assign the the property and then nothing would happen. So that'll actually be a worse head scratcher. It's like the display initialized and nothing showed. I assigned my group to the root group property or whatever it's called, and I got nothing. So part of this would be also making adding a setter that always rejects setting that property to the frame buffer classes. Basically making well, those. So, so, yeah, so let me see about renaming them first, <laughs> because that's, that would solve the problem more obviously. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, anybody else have thoughts or uh, ideas on that one? Uh, jump to the next one. Uh, I will uh, pass it over then to Dan for the next item. Okay. So this is really a kind of a build. When you clone the repo and then you want to get the submodules, the CircuitPython repo, you do make fetch submodules at the top level. Make fetch submodules, plural. And it's really, it's, it's been somewhat slow. It's really a lot slower now, first because of the Broadcom port, because there's this Broadcom firmware repo that is huge and in fact that's kind of why we added fetch submodules instead of just telling people to use the appropriate git command because it would fetch this all of this 10 gigabyte module which is kind of ridiculous and took forever and then also the scilabs port has some large submodules now too which is a problem so uh, even though we've kind of optimized that either by using partial clones 
or by using depth one, it still takes minutes. Even if you have a fast, uh, ether, uh, a fast internet connection. So I kind of like if there was a port specific fetch in each port's make file. So if you went into say the Atmel SAMD port, you could type make fetch port submodules or something like that, and it would fetch the ones just for that port. Um, and I've been looking how to, about how to automate that. I mean, there are two issues about automating it. One is, which submodules do you fetch? And that, the answer to that is, maybe we should just have a list, but then you have to update it. Or maybe we should use directories, because everything in lib you may as well fetch. And everything in ports, name of the port, you might fetch, but you're not going to fe fetch a different port submodules in a particular port. And the other thing about automating is, should it be something that's done so automatically that it happens when you type make and you're making a board? And that's possible too. Um, it's really slow to do that if you, if you do uh, git sub module update minus minus init. That's like doing it for all the submodules takes also like 30 seconds, which is kind of ridiculous. So you don't want to do that. Because it does, does a lot of work for each submodule. Uh, Git submodule status, if you want to try that, you'll notice that it prints something in the first column. It prints a, a space if the submodule is fine. It prints a minus if it's never been fetched, which you probably haven't seen. And it prints a plus if it's like off, if it's, if it's at the raw commit. So uh, I started writing a tool to parse that. I originally started writing it in shell, and that was a waste of time. So then I started writing it in Python. Um, but I, I kind of want to figure this out. And I, I, meant, I put this all in an issue. And then Bill ADAT noted that he sometimes like wants to work disconnected from the internet. So he, he will do a top level make fetch submodule. So he said, don't take that away because I might want to work disconnected. And I, I didn't, hadn't, that occurred, hadn't occurred to me, but I take that. Uh, as a consideration. So is there anything else that in terms of people's workflow that they would like prefer or not? I mean, I sometimes do something where I deliberately set a commit, I set, set a submodule to a different commit than the uh, quote official one in order to do some debugging or something. And if the make target tried to reset it every time, I might get kind of annoyed about that. So that's why I was thinking about maybe not automating that part. Yeah, I think at most it should automate making an initial, um, making that initial submodule. So if it's not there at all, if it's not initialized, do initialize it. Yeah. I think that would be fine. But to ever change it without my specific permission, I think is likely to make me lose some of my work. Um, I understand why some folk might want that because then they're freed from thinking about submodules at all and submodules are cognitive load we don't want. But I, th I think doing it explicitly is fine, but making it, a making it possible to get less. Um, another thing that we have is we have the scripts that the CI uses, which are those in tools. Don't those uh, also make some choices about what to what some modules to initialize depending on what is being done? They do, but they don't do it in the way they're they're sort of like use case is different. Like they're much more interested in doing a shallow clone and using the caches and stuff. And I'd rather use partial clones if we can. Um, I'll look at I'll look at those scripts. They're they're sort of a lot more complicated, and I'm not sure if they're as applicable. Uh, but I'll look at those. It would be nice if when we were all done, there was just one set. And if if you create, for instance, better make file rules, maybe those could be used from the CI process. But I'm not totally familiar with what the CI process is trying to do there. Either. Yeah, and it uses a kind of a different technique for figuring that stuff out, um, which may be better or worse. I'm not sure. The other thing is that this git gets submodule status function, which is actually really, really useful, it's, it only prints things in like a human readable format, which is kind of annoying. You can't get that information easily. 
um, otherwise. But I could have, I could, I could print a warning. Like if your mod submodules are off, maybe this is a nice solution. If your submodules are not what they expect to be when they do a make board, I, it'll it'll say, hey, you need to update your submodules, or these submodules are not what I expect them to be. And then somebody who like pushes their repo forward, like the, the, but forgets to update the submodules, would not get confused. Like they get they'd see that warning. So I think that maybe that's that's the easiest thing that that follows in your your idea of like doing it, not doing it automatically, but nevertheless we could warn people. So maybe I'll do it that way. Uh, I'll look at all this, and I'll also look more carefully at what the CI does. It's it's. I appreciate not you really, looking into this, Dan. What? Yeah, it's really not. I appreciate you looking into it. Thank you. It's really not. Submodules are not. There's there's a lot. They could be a lot nicer to use than they are. <laughs> I guess is what to say. Even like git submodule for each, it only does for each over the submodules that have already been initted. It skips the ones that haven't been initted, so that's another complication. So you have to parse which submodules there are manually. So uh, if you're doing git, there's usually the porcelain flag. Um, porcelain is like I want to script it and. It's fragile, so they call it porcelain. Yeah, but they did these, but it doesn't have those. But some module doesn't do that. It doesn't have okay. porcelain flags. Uh, yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll look. I'll look more carefully though at that. But it's it's not in the documentation, at least what I want. Mm. So I'm ending up. It turns out if you use git git config, it can parse the .git modules file because it's a standard format. And you can actually extract mm. things from it, but it doesn't. There's no like JSON output or anything like. That. All right, I'll stop talking about this because it's really it's even more in the weeds. The weeds are very tall here. But thanks for everybody's I, ideas about this. I've been really liking how fast, how much faster fetch mo submodules is now. Anyway, so. it is nice. Yeah, it is. I, right. Yeah, I would definitely appreciate any any possible improvements on that. Um, okay. I don't do it very often, and so when I do, it's just I go do other things. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Thank uh, it's you. much worse for those who don't do it regularly than for those who do, which is weird. And so we don't think about it as much. Mm -hmm. And if you have a slow internet connection, it's like go eat lunch. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dan, uh, and everybody uh, else for that conversation. That will get us to the end of In the Weeds. Uh, so I'll go on with the wrap up. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, this has been the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for May the 30th, 2023. Thank you to everyone who participated. Uh, again, if you'd like to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available under major uh, on major podcast services. Uh, it will also be featured in the Python for Microcontroller uh, newsletter. Uh, visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to that. The next meeting will be at the normal time uh, on Monday uh, next week uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, this meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join at adafru.it slash discord. Uh, you do need to have the CircuitPythonistas role if you would like to speak during the meeting. Uh, so if uh, that uh, is something you'd like to do and you don't already have that role, just ask us for it. Um, but with that, uh, that's going to do it for today. So thanks again, everybody, and we hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.